Hey everybody, it's me, Sam Talent. I'm coming to you from a bathroom in Adelaide, Australia. This uh, episode is not a traditional thing. It's just me and another guy being funny, because Lund, uh, after the success of his special, has refused to answer any texts or calls from us because he's busy on a uh, just a bed of mozzarella cheese right now. Uh, so I did this episode with my tour manager, Jez Watts, a very funny comedian here in Australia who I've been on the road with for two weeks. And he has an infinitely fascinating story, and I want to share it with you guys. So please enjoy this episode uh, with me and Jez Watts. You can find him online. And we'll be back next week with our regularly scheduled two-on-one where me and Lund just bully Becker into submission and then use his awkward pauses to uh, get our shit in. Hey, you can see me if you're in Australia. Um, so I'm coming to Brisbane. I'm coming to Gold Coast, coming to Cairns. Then I'll be in Paris. But I'll be back in the States, everyone. I'm coming back home. I'll be in Boston the second weekend, uh, the 8th and 9th of September. Then I'll be in where? Austin, Texas. Uh, SamTalent.com has all the stuff you need. And please join our Patreon because we got so much great shit over there. Now, please enjoy this episode with me and the Jazz Man. Love you guys. Peace. All right, so this is Sam, and I'm here with Jez Watts. Hello. And we're driving uh, from Sydney to Canberra right now. And Canberra is the kind of just like where Parliament is. Yeah, it's like uh, Washington D.C. of a tiny, Russell's. of a tiny place. Yeah. So there's nothing there for us. It's a lot of roundabouts. Okay. <laughs> it's a Monday. It's August 7th. Uh, it's Monday. We have 32 tickets sold. <laughs> we, we think that's... We, maybe 40 is achievable. <laughs> I hope it's going to be 40. Now, uh, I wanted to have Jez. Jez, Jez is going to be with me for the next... Uh, he's been with me for the first week um, in Sydney. And then we're going to be doing this week in Melbourne together, right? Yeah, and then you're done. You don't. You, do you go to Perth and no, Adelaide? No, I'm going to Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane. Oh, okay. And then, uh, then Richo the Wild Man's with you for the last couple of days. Yeah, Richo the uh, the reformed methamphetamine using <laughs> tradesman <laughs> who's paid for this whole tour. Yes, who had his honestly lovely. I thought when my first because he said colored like right away, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is probably going to be difficult. But uh, we, Emily and I were with him on the way to Newcastle, on the way back from Newcastle, and he uses all the speech, like, he uses the vocabulary of someone who's, like, in deep, uh, like, cognitive therapy, who's trying to address the wrongs of his upbringing and, like, get out of the patterns uh, that were provided to him. But Jez is a normal guy. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, Jez, tell us, tell us about the man that is... Jez Watts. Tell you about the man. Yeah, because you have an f- insane weird backstory that you give hints at here and there. <laughs> um, well, I'm a, yeah, all right. So I'm a former neuroscientist. Um, I used to be in the Australian Army. You were in the Army? Yeah, I used to. I didn't know that. I also used to be a meth head. <laughs> Um, Were these concurrent? So you're, you're from are, where? Uh, what's that? So, so start at the beginning. All where right. are you from? So I'm from Perth in Western Australia, the worst place in the world. Yes. Um, Which the world's richest woman lives there, right? She like oh, owns that's true. the mines or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, um, yeah, she rapes the earth and, and <laughs> civilization. Yeah, she just... That's really what WA is all about. It's just like really destroying as much of the planet as you can from the most remote place in it. Yeah, they just extract all the nutrients from Mother Earth, from Mother Gaia. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And then they sell them to China, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then also become racist to Chinese people, which is, oh, yeah. like, it's a cognitive dissonance that is, I think, hard to square. Uh, yeah, Perth is... Uh, and crystal I, meth is big there. That's why I got into it. It was just, I just wanted to keep up with my friends. Yeah, you want to look like a loser. <laughs> yeah. So there's, like... You got to break out the glass barbie. Is Western Australia where like all the all the young men go there? They work in the mines. They make a shitload of money. So they buy money. the utes, they, right? They buy ski, but like like uh, yeah, they jet skis and jet shit. skis and uh, yeah, they squander everything they earn. They just piss it away. <laughs> yeah, they don't know what to do. They're like twenty years old and they're pulling in and like one hundred twenty k. Oh, more than oh, I mean one hundred twenty k American probably. Yeah, um, yeah, probably two hundred thousand Australian. Whoa. Um, but they do fly in, fly out, right? So they're like. They go and they, they live in the holes for, like, four four days or like six days. Like, literally underground, right? Literally underground. Yeah. They're um, mole people. 
<laughs> that's right, they're mole people. Um, then they come back to the city and like they they're not friends with anyone because they're away all the time. So then they just have all this money and they do. That's they. That's I think a big reason crystal meth is big over there is because it's out of your system quick. Yeah, so they get the drug tests are passed and also they can work like forty eight hour shifts. <laughs> that's that's also true. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing like meth to make you feel like you're on top of things. So that's the thing about crystal meth. Like, uh, there's a great uh, nonfiction book called Methland about the states. Oh yeah. And meth was really big where I grew up, but it's like, yes, it makes working long hours easier. But like, also, if you're living like a bleak, lonely life, Ugh. like methamphetamine does a good job of making you feel happy. You know, like it makes life, it makes for, like a sad time feel a little bit brighter yeah, for a period of time. I think you're right. st- you're stealing happiness from future you. Yeah, to yeah. To use now for sure. <laughs> but I don't think anyone who's working like as a mole person is too concerned about <laughs> building a retirement plan for the future. Yeah, I suppose not. I mean, the the true irony, I think, that's a lot of people like shoot for like a lot of people who get into that are like, oh, great, I'll do this for a year or two, Stack and then I'll cash. buy a house, right. And then I'll have lady. property. Yeah, and then I'll have my life together. Prove I'm not a homosexual. Well, you have to do that. Yeah, that's yeah, a that big part of it. That was my army time as well. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but then very few of them were able to follow through on that, you know? And, like, the ones who did, like, they, they sort of don't even talk about it. It's like they went to war. Oh, they yeah. They never, like, mentioned <laughs> that they worked in the mines for two years. And they, it, then just at some point you realize, oh, you're 27 and you own two houses. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I did a couple of years in the mines. Two houses, eight teeth. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's like, also you get addicted, not just to, obviously, the money, but the lifestyle. Like, yeah, being able to do whatever you want, whatever yeah. you want to do it. And you're surrounded by other mental youths. Yes. You're just with other, like, kids who have a shitload of cash. Is it the kind of situation, because in the States, like in North Dakota, um, when they find oil, they'll have these boom towns still. Right. And um, they'll build, like... Uh, like tough sheds like aluminum sheds that are hotels like overnight so people can live there right and then the, there'll be a bar that opens up in a tent across the street and in that tent like a bottle of beer is like twenty dollars because these guys have so much cash on hand right that they can then suit the economy to the amount of expendable income well that's yeah that's like a i think a big part of the reason like the cost of living in perth is actually quite high especially to live in the middle of a desert because they can get away with and it. a cultural wasteland and it's because it has all that mining money sure um, even the like the Perth Fringe, which is like the major arts festival that happens there every year, like one their major sponsor is a company called Woodside, who like are just like absolute earth rapers, <laughs> and loads of artists have like complained about that. And I think at some point, like Woodside, like pulled some level of their sponsorship, and the whole festival didn't fold, but it like it basically halved inside. It's uh, inside because they have so much money. So much of the economy in WA is that. It'd be like if Shell Oil brought you the High Plains Comedy Festival. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Think how great all... that festival would be. Oh, it would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we'd be staying in helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the accommodation. Yeah, they're just arts washing their stuff, you know? Like, um, when I was still... Like, when I was doing my um, my honors thesis, when I was... Uh, like, I was researching for, like, the, the Telethon, like, Kids Institute. Like, it's like a... Like a research institute to like uh, look into like uh, kid child health benefit stuff. Sure. And um, I got a grant of like ten grand or t- like twenty thousand dollars, I think, from um, a company called Circo, who they're the people who administer the refugee island that Australia keeps and keep them in like horrible like concentration camp adjacent kind of vague stuff. Yeah. It's but they, so they, when people but then come they give, over here, they put them on that island and they lock them up <laughs> forever until right. they die. You know, it's like horrible. What was that movie? Rabbit proof fence. There, yeah, I, yeah. I remember America was, uh, we saw, we were given some film about that. where like a, yeah, sure. some white girl, like somehow winds up on the island. And right. Then, she like makes friends with like Syrians and like Kuala Lumpurians. Exactly. And she realizes these are people too. These, yes, they are human beings. Yeah. That, uh, you know the government has decided are uh, inconvenient. Um, but yeah, so Circo gave me twenty grand, and then they go, oh look, we're looking, we're helping kids. Right. Yeah. And it's like that is one hundred percent what Woodside's doing with giving money to the arts festival. And they just gave twenty grand to a reformed meth addict. <laughs> that's, that's true. To like investigate, like you got, that's interesting. You have two reform methodics on your tour. I think that most of, the, I mean, I think Andrew Wolf has dabbled. You know? Oh, he <laughs> hasn't. No, yeah, that's that has to be the case. Yeah, every know? Australian I've met likes a bit, wee bit of the glass. You know, <laughs> they like to spin the dick. I mean, cocaine's so expensive and bad here. Yeah, and also like 
Australia's finest homemade Coke is uh, is methamphetamine. Yeah. And you guys you guys do it at a high level it's here. A DIY culture. So, so yeah, I wonder like. Okay, so you you start you start in Perth. You live in Perth. You're a child in Perth. I was a child. Yes. Okay. And then when do you join the army? Uh, I joined the army like pretty much out of high school. Uh, and what age is that when you're done with high school? You're 18? Oh, like, uh, I think 18, not, well, like, 18 is probably when you graduate. Like, I think I joined 19. Okay. I was only in for, like, a few years, and, um, I didn't, like, go to war or anything. The biggest thing I did Well, is, yeah, you're Australian. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Oh, we sent people- some seals We somewhere? sent people to Iraq to commit war crimes, Well, you know? thank you for backing us up. Yeah, man, you gotta do some war crimes. You had to. Uh, yeah, we do have to, I yeah. think, for economic reasons. Or we would've said, shit, no more sugar for you guys. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, the biggest thing I did is I, I, I got deployed to Malaysia for something called Rifle Company Butterworth, but it's just to do, like, three months of jungle warfare training or whatever. And it was the first time I'd left Perth, and I realized there was, like, a, a universe outside of the most isolated city on the planet. Yeah. And so then I started traveling the world and stuff. So I lived, um, yeah, I lived, like, all over the world for, like, the next five or six years. And that's when I, like, I got married for what... It's going to be, I guess, technically now going to be my first wife, but was my only wife at the time. Sure. Uh, and so we got married in Las Vegas with, like, uh, while tripping on LSD with, like, Elvis impersonator, which is not a good way to do it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it was scary. It was very frightening. Some people get married in their, like, childhood home's backyard. I think yours <laughs> is totally fine. No, we, I mean, it, we should never... We were, like, drug buddies... Uh, we smoke a lot of crystal meth together. Actually. So, so you, so you go from jungle warfare training, which is what you with a machete, like just hacking down trees, <laughs> yeah, figuring sure. out how to dig like punji punji pits. Yeah, sure, that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah. and then you go avoiding where, malaria. That's huge. Having leeches uh, suck your blood. That's fun. And that was when you were when you get when you get malaria, then they put the leeches on you. Right? I guess so. Like, that's probably the old the old school move. Yeah, because all medicine here until like the eighties was just like pretty much medieval like shaman and uh i guess shaman's probably not a word you guys use right oh i mean uh i had a sh I, uh, I had a shaman uh take me on an ayahuasca ceremony doesn't surprise me at all <laughs> so where was your first stop when you left australia after you get out of the army Were oh you i lived out of the army uh i sort of a little bit i sort of ran away a wall right I, now <laughs> I, I ran away a little bit yeah and um, I actually thought when I left the country, I was not 100% sure because I definitely left under. I went. Listen, it wasn't like I got a proper formal discharge. And I sort of ran away a bit, and then they were trying to get me to come back for a while. So you committed treason. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're a deserter. Well, yeah, I mean, a little bit. And we can put a bow on it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was something when I left the country uh, for the first time where I was like flying to Germany. And uh, when I was sitting on the plane, I wasn't sure if like MPs were gonna like Be come, waiting. like just we'll just come and get onto the plane. Like, yeah. Um, when they didn't, I was like, oh, I guess it was okay that I sort of left. Yeah. But um, I think they sort of just went, well, he was such a terrible soldier. Like, what's the greater crime against the country? Yeah, Let, probably, letting him leave or having him continue to defend our freedom? You know? Right. You would have just been like a landmine detective. I was such a bad soldier. I was a real bad fit. Um, well, it wasn't whimsical enough for you. It wasn't enough <laughs> yeah. song and animation. That's yeah. I like yeah. I like a bit of fun. And you being very analytic probably didn't help with you being a soldier. No, the yeah, the autism didn't help. <laughs> I yeah, I remember going around like because I joined the infantry, which is also wrong as a choice. Yeah, you um, probably could have done better. You seem like a smart. I mean, you are a smart guy. Oh yeah, I definitely like would have qualified for other things. I think at the time I. I had this idea as a, as a young kid, like 19 years old or whatever. Like, I was always good at school and stuff, and I was like, oh, I want to do something I'm bad at to grow. Okay. And so I picked, like, the thing that I thought was, like, the farthest from my skill set or whatever. Which is legalized murder. <laughs> Which is, yeah, mur murdering people for fun. Yeah. Um, but so yeah. His first stop was, what, Berlin, probably? That's where all no, young lived... hopheads go. <laughs> no, I lived in Dresden for about oh, nine months. Okay, because you wanted to wear a top hat and a bow tie? And yeah, sure, you know. Carry like, a cane and a monocle? Hang out at the slaughterhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Which was probably, what, with a rave place? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was, like, an art installation there when okay. I went there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was dating a German girl who I'd met, um, we drove around Australia together and stuff, and then, like, her visa ended, and I was like, oh, I love her so much, I'm gonna go to Germany to be with her, and She should've gotten American Express, instead of visa, see, so that's the credit card joke. That's, that's, yeah, that's great. It's not bad, someone <laughs> had to do it, you're too close to it to see it, it's right there. This is what 
17 years in the biz gives you? Yes, we're passing Wollongong, by the way, <laughs> which is the name of a real place. <laughs> Having Wollongong on the left. <laughs> Uh, but yes, yeah, so I went to Dresden, lived with her until my money ran out, went to the UK, like worked until I had money, went back to Germany and stuff. And then like a, we did a bunch of travel and then uh, I cheated on her with the girl I married. Uh, who was Wait, also, so you who were maintaining was, a monogamous relationship with this drifter you met? <laughs> That's right. That's crazy. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Nesta. Uh, okay. You know? Yeah. I love, yeah, I love love. Now, are you actually... Autistic, because yeah. in America people just they'd be like, "Well, I like train horns, so I must be on the spectrum." Yeah, listen, I mean, it's something that I'm on like a waiting list to get diagnosed right now because I more or less because I started, I realized I have I, socialized healthcare for you. Yeah, I realized I was, and also it's going to be cheap, so that's yeah. nice. Um, in eighteen months, when you finally get your fucking, it's literally eighteen months. By the way. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's something that I sort of realized. Come on, it's- over the last maybe six months to a year. Like, I got into therapy and stuff, like, for other reasons. But, um, but I sort of realized that it was more than likely true. And then when I started to talk to other people in my life, they were like, oh, no, you absolutely are, like, for sure on the spectrum. Um, so it's something that now, because I'm talking about it on stage, I want to get diagnosed just for that. What's well, going to help sell some tickets? Well, I don't want to do that bullshit. You're, you're going to be the next Nanette. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, plenty of people are doing that show, and I don't want to do that show. Yeah. But just, like, I have jokes about it. Yeah, you doing a fully immersive animated rabbit experience where there's songs and dance that you yeah, do that, everything yourself? There's yeah. nothing autistic about that. No, no, no. That's all neurotypical behavior. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um... But yeah, because I have jokes about it. I had a, I've had a couple of audience members like pull me up after shows and be like, "Yeah, you can't make jokes." You're like, stealing valor. Yeah, exactly. It's like I already like committed treason. I think I should be allowed. Yeah, that's, that's why like, you changed your name so many times. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, that's we, we didn't cover that. So yeah, my legal name is Jez uh, White Rice Supreme. White Rice Supreme. Yeah, White Rice is my middle name with a hyphen. And Supreme. And last name Supreme is, is, is God given. Supreme is my la- is my surname. Right? Yes. Yes. So, you Why? know. Why? What kind of, where did Supreme come? Is that because when Australians came here, they got to give themselves <laughs> names? Like, I'm Jeremy Warlord, everyone. <laughs> I'm, you have I'm, to kill I'm, a lot of uh, the indigenous population to get that title. I'm Bosco Skull Splitter. <laughs> I'm the king of Wollongong. Yeah, it, it, so that's not my birth name, right? So my birth name is uh, Jeremy James Wynn. Okay. Um, but when I got married the first time, like in Vegas with the LSD and all, with, to my drug buddy and stuff, yes. we decided rather than like her take my name, which is like outdated, or us do a hyphen because we had planned to have kids, which is lucky for everyone that we did not. Yeah. Um, we'd pick a new last name together. And so we decided to pick Supreme so that we'd be able to introduce ourselves to people as like the Supremes. And you guys are like hype beasts. You guys were like, this is the best clothing company in the world. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a, actually, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of brands that are that I've noticed since then. So you're gonna be Jez and Sassafras Supreme. <laughs> <laughs> I assume I assume her name. You don't have to say it, but it's probably like Lilac or like. Uh, oh, that's so close. Oh yeah, Daphne. Daphne. Okay, Daphne S- Supreme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a eugenicist. And so we had um, we had planned the two kids, right? We'd already named them. Or were they going to be named? Um, <laughs> so we we made a deal where I could pick the first name of the boy, middle name of the girl, and she could have the others. Sure. And so they we're going to be Moses Danger Supreme. Jesus So Christ. Danger is his middle name. Of course. And then uh, Zoe Disco Supreme. My God. So it's great that they don't exist. I'm so happy that didn't happen. Those, yes. Those... <laughs> They'd be running grifts all over Canterbury <laughs> right now. <laughs> what a horrible life they would lead. Yeah. You guys would live in a treehouse, you know? <laughs> But yeah, so uh, I changed my last name to Supreme, and it's like it's one fee to change your name. And I was like, oh, everyone's been calling me Jez for years before I did comedy. Yeah. So I changed my first name to Jez. And then the middle name, it's like I was already changing everything. And my brother's birth middle name is Ace. And I was always mad about that. What's happening here? I don't know. These are Australian people behind the <laughs> wheel of a moving vehicle. It's, it's dangerous. It's not allowed. Um, so yeah, so I was kind of like, oh, I'll just pick a new middle name. And so. The middle name of White Rice. I mean, it's a silly thing, but um... no. <laughs> it seems pretty somber. <laughs> You're really honoring the tradition with that. <laughs> um, it came like so. We were in New York, like after the wedding, and we're hanging out with um, 
this uh, friend of ours from Boston, and we found like a little monogram nameplate that's a HWR, and we were just we found we had found all these like expired drugs in like prescription medication in like this guy's apartment. They were moving out, and so we were like just eating these random pills. This and, is in where I'm sorry. In uh, New York. Okay. And having a, and having a great day. And we decided in the day to like come up with a backstory for the owner of the nameplate. And so we decided it was a guy named Howard White Rice, who was like an investment banker, and he had like money in the Caymans, he had a secret family in Mexico. And like we just spent all day coming up with this silly little backstory. Mm-hmm. And then like we left New York, and I haven't since then seen my friend from Boston. And at the time, I was like, oh, I might never see him again. He didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, he was in my head. I was yes. imagining him. And so, uh, when it came time to change the name, like, Daphne was there for that as well, and she was like, oh, why don't you pick White Rice, and it'd be, like, a connection between you and, and your friend Alex, sure. and you'll have that forever. And so I changed the name, and then I emailed him the next day after I, like, formally changed it, and got the paperwork, and I was like, hey, man, you never guess my new middle name is, it's White Rice, like, Howard White Rice, like, how cool is that? And he emailed me back, and he's like, who's Howard White Rice? Like, he didn't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so the whole thing the middle name is just like an in-joke with myself now that I'm like I don't share with anyone yeah because you guys thought you were getting high on like Valium <laughs> and Adderall but it was really probably just like heartworm medication <laughs> but do I have heartworm? no no you don't and uh yeah so that's because your current girl is a <laughs> she's a veterinarian yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah she gives me deworming tablets for sure <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did take some actually the other week. Did some deworming chocolate because she was eating deworming chocolate. I was like, "What? Have you got worms?" She said, "Oh, vets can get worms, and they can give worms to their partner." Have you heard of deworming chocolate, honey? No. Emmy's it's in the back. delicious. I bet it is. I used to eat. My mom had these uh, these chocolates that were supposed to be like um, they were big in the states in like the mid '90s, and they were like uh, they were like weight loss chocolates. I think that they like oh. they like gathered like the fat in your food and then like made it so your body didn't digest oh, it. Oh, gives you a nice bit, it. Of, nice bit of anal drip. Yeah, but I was just eating them because I was a little <laughs> fat kid, and I like found them in her closet. And I was like, oh, mommy's got secret chocolates, and then just really dropped like it. It was it looked like I lo- it was like a third trimester, like I lost the baby type thing. <laughs> I remember the turd; it was gelatinous. It looked like a squid. So you uh, you get married in Las Vegas, yeah, and you're still taking a lot of drugs. Yeah, well, we just, we decided to get off the drugs after that. Okay, we were like, right, we're getting married, we're gonna have these two children, Moses, Danger Supreme, and so on. Yes. Um, so we're gonna stop taking drugs. We're gonna go back to university and like get our lives together and stuff. So we did that, and then once we were like stopped being high together, we realized we actually like sort of did Had not, nothing in common. Did not care for one another so yeah. much. <laughs> we suddenly went up, we're on the same wavelength. Yes. So it, it was kind of a bad marriage for a good year and a half. No way. And did you, were you guys married in the States or did you guys come back here? We got married in the States and then we're like, we submitted the paperwork here and stuff. Okay. But, um, so we were like properly married. But yeah, we like went to uni, uh, like university and like started started getting our degrees and then we broke up, of course. In Australia? In Australia. Okay. Yeah, and that was uh, back in Perth actually. Okay, and you, after you break up, you get, you said four degrees? Yeah, I mean, they're just worthless, but, um... Right, but are these, like, two-year, are these, like, are these real associate's degrees, are these bachelor's degrees? I don't know the equivalent. Yeah, so I guess I've got, like, uh, I've got two bachelor's degrees and then a bachelor's with honors, which was, like, I did, like, a year-long... This is what Circo gave me that money for, actually, but I did, like, a year-long research project uh, in, um... I was, like, researching this particular kind of mus- muscular dystrophy, um, and then that's the honors degree. And then I did, I was doing a doctorate in neuroscience when I started comedy. Whoa. And so I ended up quitting that to drive you around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and shanghai into being this tour manager. Exactly. That I absolutely didn't want to do it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, gl- I'm glad. Well, see, that's what sucks. Cause like, I'm glad you're here. Cause we, we oh, met when I was in Melbourne last time I was here. Yeah, absolutely. It was you and your buddy, Glenn. And I thought you guys were both fucking righteous dudes. And we went to dinner. Yes, uh, we And did. Glenn didn't have a dime to pitch on dinner. No, well, listen, he's, hey, well, he's a poor Glenn, man. Glenn, I never forgot, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, Glenn and I were drinking a uh, shitload of pints. That was... Uh, That's the, the list, day you shit the... Listeners of the pod will know. That was the, <laughs> directly preceding me shitting the bed and having the worst <laughs> panic attack slash hangover in my entire career as a human being. <laughs> I was with Jez and his bald mate, Glenn. <laughs> and Glenn told us about he was dating a girl and, like... 
Oh, her, and her kid her has kid like a like bubble a, butt. A huge righteous butt. Yeah. <laughs> and he hates the kid. Yeah. Except the kid has the mother's butt, which he loves. Right. But he's, and he's not attracted to the kid. He, was, he thought it was very funny that the kid had a huge funky ass. And I was like, you know, 12 pints of VB deep. And I was like, Glenn, you got to take it on stage, man. <laughs> yeah. He you got to talk about not, this kid's rump. He still has not done that, by the way. <laughs> well, it's probably for the best. <laughs> but so, yeah, you left very uh, quickly at one point. I think you felt a rumbling, maybe. Well, no, I went to Hungry Jack. <laughs> oh, this is what caused I it. went to Hungry Jack, and I had uh, a couple Whoppers or whatever. Yep, sure. And then just woke up in a flotilla of my own <laughs> fucking feces. <laughs> I've covered it enough on the pod. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. I never told you that? No. You don't know this? Oh, wow. No. Yeah. it's. I had comedians messaging me the day after that pod law, like, yeah. dropped, to be yeah. like, hey, you know you shot the bed? Yeah. Yeah, I shot the bed very bad, baby. Like, the f- first night I was in Melbourne in my hotel room, and I had to pack up all the sheets and bedding into a pillowcase <laughs> and then carry it outside like I was a hobo going to work in the apple orchard just over my shoulder. And then I slept on a nude bed for the next five days or whatever. <laughs> you didn't know this? Gross, no. Do you like to know that now? No. Do you feel closer to me? No. No? <laughs> anyway. Hey everyone, let's talk about Manscaped, huh? I know you guys love talking about undies and, uh, you know, uh, mental health apps, but today we're talking about keeping your wangus clean. If you're thinking of skipping this ad because you already have a gross trimmer you've used since college, just shut the fuck up for a minute and listen to me, Sam Talent, voice of the Chubby Behemoth podcast. We're talking about your balls here, your sack, your nads, your grundus. You can't just use whatever has been rustling away in the shower for years. It says rusting away, but I like to think of a trimmer that's just on all the time, rustling around. It's time to grow up and shave with Manscaped. Their Platinum Package 4.0, not 1.0, not 2.0, not 3.0, 4.0, just like the average length of our listeners' penis, has everything you need to get grooming, and I'm talking centimeters. It comes with a lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker 2.0 for ear and nose hair grooming for all of the <clears throat> very old listeners, Crop Reviver Ball Toner, and their ultra premium line of body products, including deodorant and body wash. Look, guys. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a big old uh, bowl of cum for lunch. Uh, I use this thing, and I use it on my, my sweet, sweet money maker. I use it on my face. That's how good it is. That's how clean of a shave you receive. I'm, I have this thing on the road with me. I'm using the Lawnmower 4.0 every other day, keeping my wife happy. I rub it all over her, her bald head, my chin, and I say, nuzzle with the wuzzle, because I've been in Australia. Um, so I love it. The Lawnmower Trimmer is a total game changer. It has a 7,000 RPM motor for all of our autists and a spotlight so you can see what you're up to, because <laughs> I know so many of you are shaving in the dark. You guys are in a mine shaft, just hacking away at your pyumbus. Um, and it's totally waterproof. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code CHUBBY at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code CHUBBY, C-H-U-B-B-Y. Use the platinum package because the gold standard is no longer good enough. <laughs> so you're getting your degrees. Yes. And then why do you start stand-up comedy? Oh, I mean, I just love... I. I've loved stand-up comedy forever. I just had, like, really low self-esteem. I didn't I didn't realize you could start and be bad and slowly get better. Yeah, you have to be. But you're very... You're the worst comic in the world when you start. Of course. I know. Yeah. I was particularly. And, um... Yeah, but it was just that thing of, um... I, I even, like, didn't realize I could be a scientist until my then... Uh, then wife, like, enrolled. And I went, oh, yeah, I'm, Greg, I'm smarter than you. I could probably do science as well. Yeah. Um... But, yeah, I just, I mean, I loved, loved comedy. And I wish I'd started it earlier, but uh, what it took was I did, like, a year exchange in the States at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Interesting. Uh, it was a very good university. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it's also a pretty hippy-dippy part of North Carolina. That's true. I was worried it was North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, no. But it's like right a college spot. town. And is that Raleigh or Durham? Yeah, just near there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Chapel Hill. Chapel yeah. Hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, uh, the classes were like real difficult because right near the end of my degrees and, um, I ended up just being like, I'd just been divorced and stuff. And as much as we shouldn't have been together, I was still a mess. And, uh, I realized pretty quickly and I was like, I don't care about this. And then I ended up, I met a girl in New York and I stayed on a couch for like way too long, like three months. And I would just like go to the comedy cellar every night 
and I met someone who was like an open micer just in Brooklyn and that's what did it for me I went oh you can start yeah you can just start and not be great like I only knew incredibly great comics because I'm in Australia just watching things on YouTube or whatever and it's just like oh people who are exceptional at it I thought were the only people who were doing comedy yeah, I think when you're a kid, it's, like, really hard to realize, like, at least... Like, it's achievable. Well, it's, like, you can just go... On, you can just sign up at an open mic. Exactly. It's, like, the, you feel like there's, like, this whole, like, gravitas to it. Like, there's, like, the sacred few who are allowed to do stand-up. Exactly. And it's, like, no, any idiot can wander into the fucking bar on a Tuesday and put their name on the piece of paper. Yeah, and yeah. Me- and meeting someone... And she was funny, but, it, like, just meeting someone who was in that beginning phase, I went, oh, shit, I can start to... And you're so- really bad. Look at you. <laughs> and so I immediately... Yeah, started like, you know, write, I wrote like a big list of things. I just, I basically wrote down a list of stories I'd use to get laid, more or less, right? Sure. Just like, because I was just like, I'm not a big, uh, like, alpha male or whatever. My whole thing was always just to entertain someone long enough that at some point we were having sex. Sure, yeah. And just be fun. Yeah, you just around. keep spinning the plates. Just be fun to be around enough that they are willing to have sex with me. Sure, yeah. Um, oh, I've... So I thought I had an hour. I'm, f- <laughs> I'm familiar with that boy. <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit A in the back. <laughs> but yeah, I thought I had... So I wrote down this list of stories, basically, and I went, oh, great, I've got, I've got my first hour, I thought. And, you know, none of that is in anything, of course. No. But, um, but yeah, then I did my first open mic when I got back to Perth. And then, so, so you didn't you didn't go up in New York for your first time? No, no. Like I, I sort of, I think it, it took a long like it took a long time to emotionally switch from this idea that I was always just going to be a fan of stand up to I could be participating in creating it. Right. And so it was a long sort of like dial up time, you know, where I sort of had decided I was going to do it, but from actually there to doing my first spot took me a good few months it also must have been intimidating like if you go to Mecca to become an Iman like you're in New York City yeah like what, yeah, watching like you know Todd Barry or, or Big J or whatever or Sarah Silverman David or whatever, Tell just, yeah David Tell oh man I wish I'd seen David Tell <laughs> he's the greatest he's the greatest comedian in the world yeah. but um yeah like but there was so many people um like Gary Goldman and stuff like at the cellar who were just such high level comedians um I mean, getting to see that live... That was the first time I'd ever seen live comedy. Was yeah. at the Comedy Cellar. Kind of sets the bar impossibly high. Yeah, it was this thing I was like, oh, I I now realize I'm allowed to start, but I really want to be good. So yeah. I, like, took extra time to, like, prepare and, like, read a, read a book about comedy. Which or, book did you read? Uh, I think it's... What is it? Zen and the Art of Stand-Up Comedy, I think, maybe, okay. was the name of it. It was a long I time ago. I know if you ago, read, now. like, Richard Belzer's book or the... Uh, no. There's a bunch of these books that people read, and then they're like, okay, so the first step to being a comic is getting a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need a suit with patches on the elbows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that thing of, like, there probably were a, f- there probably were a few relevant pieces of information in there. Sure. Um, but the main thing was just, I think, making me feel that it was less alien, yeah, maybe. Because yeah. I think as well, like, you listen to podcasts, and you listen to very good comedians talk about comedy forever and then you go right I've got the inside track I know how it all works but it's very different from a first person perspective yeah you pierce the veil yeah so yeah so I started in Perth like, and did Perth it... is like you said the most maligned well as, <laughs> as far as like the arts are concerned I mean even in Australia Australians make fun of Perth oh yes absolutely like the same way we would make fun of like uh, like Alabama or Wyoming in the states yeah, it's or just maybe like, like yokels and idiots. Or maybe like Alaska would be a good. Well, no one cares about Alaska. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but, but like I'm... we don't even talk about Alaska. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, honestly, that's probably. Yeah, I guess maybe Tasmania is like the south. Sure, sure, sure. And then that makes like sense. Perth is. I think probably Alaska is the right thing because nobody thinks about it, and there's like, uh, you know, primary resources that are just getting extracted. And it's from just the like it's like it's this isolated. is your last chance. Like you're running away. If you're moving to Perth <laughs> to get a job. Yeah. Same with Alaska. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's a, it's definitely it's super isolated. The scene there is a lot bigger than it used to be. But when I started, there was one open mic um, that you could get on maybe maybe once every couple of months, and uh, so I started a room very quickly, and then uh, some some other people started rooms, and like now it's like much more of a vibrant scene than it used to be. It's still the source of the most per capita craziness within a comedy scene in Australia sure yeah Andrew Wolf who, who <laughs> I will have on this pod next he, Monday yeah he's uh, incredible 
He, I don't know anyone like him. Have you, did you, was he around when you were starting out in Perth? No, he was in Sydney at the time. Okay. Like, because he's from Perth, but he came up in Sydney. And that's yeah. part of the reason he's so good, is he started in a bigger scene. You know? Before his wife removed him over there. His then wife. His then wife. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you're in Perth, you're doing shows, you're getting your shit together, and then when do you flee to Melbourne? Oh, uh, so I mean like... I'm all... saying Melbourne as they say it here. I know that you... we say it Melbourne, <laughs> as you should. Do you want but... me to say Melbourne? No, no, no. I'm also saying Cairns. Cairns is good. Yeah, good yeah. pronunciation. Cairns. You're local. And then also, the funniest thing that people say here is, nah. <laughs> nah. They put an R at the end of no, and it <laughs> cracks me up every time. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I wanted to leave Perth, like, really quickly. But I started dating my partner, my fiancé now. Um... Like, pretty much the week I started doing stand-up. And I remember telling her, hey, I'm going to do stand-up forever. And I don't think she believed it at the time because I was, like, doing a doctorate. Right. <laughs> uh, but wow, look at look at this territory we're driving through right now. It's very pretty. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I you know, started doing gigs around and as many as you could do at the time, which was not that many. Um, and then I wanted to move, but she had, like, this great career opportunity, so... We ended up doing this sort of devil's bargain. Like, her um, her income was going to go up like 20000 a year if she took this opportunity, but she would have had to stay in Perth for two years. Mm-hmm. And so we talked about the options, which was like, I could move to Melbourne and gig a lot more, but then over time we'd probably drift apart and we'd break up. Uh, I, and sh- she could move to Melbourne with me and turn down the opportunity and then resent me for it. Sure. And then over time we'd drift apart we'd break up um, I could stay and then I'd resent her for it so you set it up very romantically and then yeah you said, <laughs> like, look I've analyzed the data yeah. I ran it through the ones and zeros I'm autistic I'm <laughs> telling you <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what we decided in the end was um, if I could maybe tour and do like the festival system so within Australia or maybe do the Edinburgh Fringe I could have a lot of growth but we could still continue living in Perth for a couple of years and in order to do that, she would like underwrite me ten thousand of the extra twenty thousand that she was gonna get. So you meet this girl, you're about a year into stand up, and you ask for ten grand. That's right. Yeah. And, and then like, hey, that, buy in now. Yeah, and then that year I lost sixteen thousand dollars. Oh my god. Of her money. Wow. And uh Just I, producing your shows at festivals and whatnot? Yeah, so it well it's big overheads like traveling and doing the fringes so it's like I did Perth Fringe Adelaide Fringe Melbourne Comedy Festival Sydney Comedy Festival and the Edinburgh Fringe and Edinburgh I think I still I lost seven grand now. wow and uh because you have to rent the room you have to promote it all that stuff right yeah just and just flights accommodation marketing all that stuff you know and so because yeah. that is something unique to Australian comedy is like we were just in Sydney for this last week and a bunch of comics like flew in from I don't know if they all flew in but we did Some did, this yeah. run of the, the comedy store there sets up shows the whole time and then you're all on the same show together you're like a platoon and you go from theater to theater doing the shows but like Wolf flew in from Perth like you came in from Sydney or from Melbourne, from Melbourne yeah um, so yeah like I, you guys just travel so much within the continent well it's yeah I mean it's just I mean it's a small market you know it's like less than 30 million people in Australia and and it's funny Most, when you guys compare your problems to ours in the States, <laughs> when you're like, oh, you guys got a wee bit of the bigotry there, and it's like, we let people in, all right? There's 400 million of us. Oh, Australia is way more bigoted. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you guys don't want to act like it, because you yeah. guys gave your guns up after one whoopsie. <laughs> um, listen, he was the world record holder for quite a while, so yeah. I, don't don't diminish his accomplishments. But the States have lapped him like ten times over. <laughs> no, the, now they have. Yeah. He did that shit with pistols, you know? Oh, wow. That guy, he's a he's an Aussie digger, you know? Yeah. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> he's like the Jackie Robinson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He broke the color barrier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and he did the whole thing just to get famous, too. Really? I, yeah, I, I was reading up on it. Like, I have a bit about it where... It doesn't matter what the bit is, but like, um, but yeah, like his, like he was not like politically motivated. He wasn't even really mentally ill. He just sort of went, huh? I want if I'm the world record holder for the most kills in a yeah. mass murder, I'll be famous, and that's his whole motivation to do it. it was, how many, how many bodies did he claim? Uh, it was like uh, forty-seven or something like that. He did it with pistols. Well, he did like he had pistols and maybe like a rifle, but like a like a bolt action rifle. Yeah, yeah, like a musket. And he was, yeah, exactly. It's Australia, you know. Yeah, he had a cannon. 
And what year was this? Uh, ooh, 1993. Three, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, he's still in prison now, and you never see his name in the news, and, like, they've never, like, granted interviews for him, because they're like, well, fuck him, if that's his whole goal. Yeah, he just wanted to be famous. So. Yeah, yeah, at least to be mentally ill, like, a good person. It's like when they wouldn't let James Holmes see the Joker. <laughs> 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 but yeah So um, Sorry Oh yeah well Ned Kelly's cool You guys got him Oh yeah I mean Who gives a shit I, Dude uh, I read that book The True History of the Kelly Gang And then I saw the movie Was more stylized The people who own the rights To my book right now Oh yes yeah, so Did True History of the Kelly Gang Oh wow Yeah like okay. they, they They are Australian Yeah um, okay And the Vogel brothers So Anyway that's neither here nor there But there is, like, the outlaw is idolized here in Australia, and I yeah. think that's cool. I mean, I don't mind Ned Kelly. I mean, obviously, he was just an outlaw and whatever. Like, my dad went to prison for seven years. I don't care. But, um... What did he do? Oh, he did a bunch of crimes. Nice. <laughs> um, he started Is he, like, out... Zane's brother who shot a cop in no. the chest with a shotgun? More of a white collar. <laughs> okay. Embezzling. Yeah, uh, yeah so he, that was the first thing he went to prison for. So this is before I existed. Dude... But he worked for he worked at a bank when yeah. he was like young, and he had the problem I had when I was nineteen, which I thought I was so like the smartest guy in any room. It's like if you think that you're a fucking idiot, sure. But uh, he thought that, and so he embezzled money for the bank he worked for. He got caught, then he got like sent sent to jail for like six months. And then while he was in, he met some people who like boosted cars, and they taught him how to steal cars. Whoa. And then he got out, and then he stole cars for a while. Yeah. And then he went away for like a couple of years. And then when he was in, he met like a, a B and E crew, like a break and enter crew. Yeah. And then he got out. And he had a crew, so then they did break and enters. And while he was doing that, um, yeah, then like he was with he was with this woman. They had a kid and stuff. And then like he went away to prison for seven years for that. Um, That's not white collar. No, he started white collar. He okay. worked his way up. All right. Yeah, yeah. But he's not like shotgunning police in the chest. That was like the first. He's not a biker. He's not a bikey. Bike. Yeah, yeah. bikey. Which yeah. is so silly to me. Like, Zane was like, yeah, my brother got a swastika tattoo on his throat and he shot a cop in the chest with a shotgun. He's a bikey. It's like, put some respect on it. <laughs> He's a fucking motorcycle-riding hate criminal. Yeah, I mean... Anyway, that was Zane, 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 Zane seems real messed up. Dude, Zane was like... backstory. So I was like, I'm going to Australia. Not everyone can be that insane. And then Sweet Zane was like the first dude that I met at that show. Uh, yeah. The Chippo, I think. Yeah, yeah. And he just sits down and tells me about his mom and how he watched her pass and like how. Oh, he, dude. I mean, yeah. he just has a lot of trauma, but he's just telling it like it's a you know f like he wants me to buy him a beer. It was like a, it was big, like a pub story with his big shining gold tooth. It's silver. <laughs> silver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because gold would have been too ostentatious. <laughs> so you are you lose sixteen k. Oh yeah, yeah. So then I owed it, like the next year I did all the same festivals and I broke even. Um, but I still owed her the 16 grand. Yeah. And at this point, I was away for six months a year. And I was in debt to Nicole, $16,000. So a lot of people in her life started being like, maybe you should break up with this guy. Yeah. Which is very good advice that she got given. For sure. Um, but I had, but the second year of, of doing the festivals, I had done 16 grand better, right? Because I broke even yeah. compared to losing 16. And then the year after, like I made a profit, I started paying down the debt. And so it was this thing of that, that initial sort of cash investment is sort of, a lot of people get that somehow right. in Australia to start making the festival system viable because it's every time you come back to a city, you sell more tickets and you can charge more, you know? And is there like a, uh, do, so when people need that initial startup capital, are there sponsors for these? Like, how's that work? I mean, some people Look come... at this woman's driving a fucking Jeep with a safari snorkel on it. <laughs> so she can go aquatic, and she's also 53 years young. <laughs> anyway. I mean, some people just come from privilege, and, For uh, sure. you know, like, I think a lot of people, that's how they get their start in comedy. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, the it's, world over. Yeah. It's such a, you know, there's, there's such a front-loaded poverty to comedy. Yeah. That there's got to be some way that you get an income that's not jokes when you begin. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I was very lucky that in some ways and unlucky in others and, you know, like being in, starting in Perth for like probably a good four years or something, maybe five years, it definitely slowed my growth just as there weren't enough gigs. Oh yeah. It's like when people start in Omaha, Nebraska yeah. and they're like, yeah, we got three open mics here. It's great. You know, I've, 
you, you get on the road twice a year and you're like, leave here if you really want to do this. Yeah, I mean, it was the thing, if, if I wasn't in, and now we're getting married, right? So it's like it was the right call, but if, if I wasn't in a committed relationship to somebody that I loved more than anyone I'd ever loved before, right? then I would have absolutely, like a year and a half in, just moved to a bigger city. Oh yeah, like if I didn't love Emmy so much, I wouldn't have gone to Las Vegas. What was Las Vegas about? She did her, her, med, oh. her she went to med school in Vegas. Yeah, Vegas, I mean, we were there, when we got married, we were there for maybe six days, which is too long. Oh yeah. And I can't imagine living there. <laughs> we didn't, didn't we, baby? Didn't we? What? We made it through Vegas together. I mean, when we got together, were people saying, ditch this guy, he's no good? No. Only my mom. <laughs> <laughs> What'd she say? Nothing. I'm not on the pod. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's an empty update, everybody. <laughs> so you moved to Sydney. Uh, moved or, to Melbourne. Mel- moved to Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And... We moved to Melbourne like six months before the pandemic hit. Then oh, had the wow. world's longest lockdown. Yeah, you guys loved it. That was... It was great. You guys I... love following the rules. That's when... Well, all right. <laughs> you do. Australians love the rules. Rules make you safe, Sam. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you guys don't vote, they fine you, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not much. It's like 50 bucks or something. Still. But, um... Yeah, the right to abstain is still a right. Well, I mean, that's why... There's a thing here called the donkey vote, where you go in and you just, like, draw a picture of a dick on the voting form, and, like, you've checked your name off so you don't get fined. Sure. It doesn't have to be an official vote, you know? Okay. You just have to say that you went there. But, um, yeah, so... That's when my mental health took a serious decline. <laughs> yeah, of I was trapped, trapped in an apartment for seven months straight. In a new city. Yeah. Not able to do the thing that you moved there to do. No, and the only place in the world at the time that had no lockdown and no COVID was Perth, the place I'd left. Wow. Because it's the most isolated city. So and they Perth just closed didn't the borders. Have COVID? They closed the borders. They didn't oh, have COVID at all until yeah. the borders opened six, eight months later. Wow. So everyone there was just gigging up a storm. And uh-huh. I was just like, I left <laughs> that fucking place Damn it. to do gigs. And that's the only place I could have been doing it. And it uprooted us, you know, like we had to ship a horse interstate. Like that's expensive. And that was, oh, oh because Nicole has a Nicole horse. owns a horse. Yeah, yeah, she owns a horse. Okay. It costs two grand to ship, like drive the horse through the Nullarbor. Gee whiz. So COVID ends, you get back up. Let me ask you this. Mm. Have you done um, shows like all over? Have you done Darwin and uh, all done, these places? Yeah, the most. I've done at least spots, if not if not full shows, in most cities. Have you um, done the middle in Australia? No, well, it's not really much in the middle. Alice Springs is not much. Uh, mostly the coast, right? That's where everybody lives. Yeah. Because um, in the middle, don't people literally like live underneath a school bus in a hole? <laughs> I mean, that could be true. Someone told me that, like... I'm not going there. People's front doors are a bus, and they park it on top of their house, <laughs> and then you walk down the stairs through the bus to get into the house. Yeah, that. I mean, that certainly could be true. And also, you'll probably, like, you know, there's a lot of stabbings. I mean, there's a lot of crime in the middle as well. Yeah. Because who would live there but clinically insane human beings? Well, people who have $230,000 cash in their pocket, <laughs> and they bought enough meth, so now it's time to get, like, the sharpest blade they can find. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but yeah, done. Yeah, most cities in Australia, and like done some stuff overseas. Like I've done Edinburgh like three times, and toured a bit through Asia. I think Edinburgh sounds fun. I think it's great. It's a great festival. When Emmy, uh, if she can get like a contract in Scotland for a little bit, that'd be oh, cool great. to go over there. Yeah. Because housing's the big cost there, and if she's getting housing supply, it's exactly. Like, yeah. That's the the single largest overhead. Um, but yeah, the three times I did it. Like it was the best month of my life every time because the first time I went it was the best month of my life and, and then it was better, the second time better. I went it was better yeah. the third time it was better and I really had it worked out where I was like I was the only Australian I knew who by the third one was like making a profit and yeah. paying rent at home oh wow everyone else was losing thousands of dollars to do it um it's we- like the fourth dead weird marmot that we've passed <laughs> oh that happens a lot what are those uh it's well, it definitely would be kangaroos, wombats. I think that was a wombat. That was probably a wombat, I reckon. Does a capybara look like a wombat? Yeah, they look pretty similar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wombats are definitely chunky, uh, I think. Yeah, that capybara. was a little chunky creature. That's, yeah, they got... Head was crushed. They're real beefy and dead. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Edinburgh's sick. I, um, I don't think I'm going to go back, though, because it's just a big commitment going on right now too right yeah I'm yeah. like super envious 
It sounds fun. It's just like I talk to American comics who like like Ari Shafir loves it. Sean Patton loves it. Oh sure, like Canadian, I mean, Ari did Canadian my. Canadian did it like two weeks. Yeah, Ari did my showcase when I was over there last. Actually, and do you know Jessica Michelle Singleton? Yes, she's great. Like, uh, yeah, I hung out with her a bunch. Like, I mean, it's it's the largest arts festival in the world, and certainly at the time, coming from Perth, it was like getting to be on stage that month, that like that much in a month. Yeah, it was just like you could feel the difference between the beginning and end of that month, like so dramatically. Oh, for in sure. Terms of your skill level. Yeah, like you burn the fuck out by the end of that month, but you're just so much more comfortable on stage. Yeah, and you're just sharpening your steel. So what, you like, in Edinburgh, you like do your show every night and then you hop on other people's shows? Yeah, I mean, like, the reason I was making money is I was doing a f- I was doing my full hour and then I also would host a showcase at night and then I would do a bunch of spots during the day as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd be on stage maybe, like, two and a half hours probably total a day, a day wow. for, like, yeah, 22 days or 23 days or whatever. Um, but, yeah, you burn out for sure. Yeah, you need, you, I guess the, the American model is either like you produce it yourself and you eat it or someone brings you over there and yeah. people come and you don't have to pay anything, but you yeah. really don't make any money. I mean, that's, yeah, doing like the, because the, there's sort of two Edinburgh fringes, right? There's a ticketed fringe and there's the free fringe. Yeah. So the ticketed fringe, you only will lose money. There's no way to really make money. And that's like the South by Southwest where it's like the corporate event. Right. It's been monopolized by other yeah. interests. There's no... Like, the overheads of it are not... I mean, it's not constructed in a way that anyone should make money. It's constructed in a way that you get industry attention. Yeah. Um, but then the free fringe, which happens at the same time in the same city, is you do... do like, tickets are either donations in advance or on the way out of the door. And so, it's, essentially, it's a free show. Um, but you don't pay anything for the venue which is like a massive amount of overhead is gone. So the venue just gives you their space. The venue's just like, hey, if you're going to have people come in here who are going to buy drinks, cool. Sure, okay. Um, so these are in bars and shit. Yeah, but that, but they have like rooms, you know, yeah. like separate rooms. That's what's impressive about Australia is all these like hotels, I guess, which are just bars that sure. you can't really stay in anymore. Yeah, everything's called hotel, but yeah, none, yeah, none, that was none of them have accommodation. But yeah, they all have like these dedicated performance rooms in the basement, it seems. Yeah, well, like a lot of them do, yeah, for Which sure. Cool. And that's where, where the majority of shows in Australia are, are, yeah. are bar shows. Right, but they're like, it's not like you have a bar in the back where people are going to get drinks. Like, it's an actual, like, little concrete, like, 80 person seater. Sure. And it's like a black box theater almost. Yeah, it's perfect. They're perfect. Like that, uh, that one we, I did on Wednesday uh, with the flowers uh, standout. Like, that's a perfect Oh, room I love for that room. Yeah. Those guys, those guys come in so early to set up all those I flowers. Know, yeah. <laughs> and you can tell because... It's a beautiful space, though, because they make it that. Yep. I was really impressed by them. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's... Like, there's only a few, like, you know, proper comedy clubs in Australia. You know? There's, like, one in Sydney. Right, which is a good room. The comedy store. That's which set up very well. Beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Um, like, there's two in Melbourne... There's one in Perth, there's one in Brisbane. Oh, it's, I guess there's maybe two in Brisbane, but yeah, I mean, the vast majority of shows are bar shows, but in these separate spaces. Yeah. And then you have horrible open mics where people are serving and doing cocktails sure, sure. next to the stage. <laughs> the intermission is a Australian thing, which is... That's not a... Fuck no, dude. <laughs> you keep the momentum going. You yeah. don't get... You don't let it, then people, like, they get up and they go get drinks during the show, or there's, like, you know, servers, but... Right. The intermission is, like... I hate the intermission. Americans don't do an intermission ever. All right, so yeah. no intermission tonight. No, no, we'll do the intermission. I mean, I no, think we don't have to. If it's my to. choice, like, well, the, the the venue probably wants it. No, I don't give That's a shit the about the thing. venue. Well, I mean, I we should. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I want you... I want to get along. I mean, no, no, that's fair. I mean, I don't think. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the tonight's venue like demands one. Okay. Um, yeah, I hate the intermission. It's just like okay. everyone's sitting there, they're building cool. all this momentum. You got your openers, they're doing a good job, and then yep. it's the big payoff at the end of yep. the, the headliner or whatever, like. The intermission just kills all that forward-moving kinetic and, energy. Yeah, I mean, like, particularly... I mean, so many venues, they're giving you the space, essentially, like, essentially for free. Yeah. To get their drink sales. Right. And if you have an intermission, there's going to be more. That's the only reason that, like... That's why it exists. exists in the States, is because a bar has a Monday night, and they're like, no one's in here. Yeah, we want to sell drinks. Yeah, if I sell one drink to the 35 comics who come in here, like, right. we've sold more than we ever have before. 
See, I get it, but usually in the states, like the bar is in the same room, and right. they just walk up and you get your drink and you, you still sit at your stool. Um, so let me ask you this: mm. this is this is one question I had. So when you were um, in North Carolina for that year, yeah, you're recently heartbroken. Oh yeah, but you're a smart, handsome, funny <laughs> guy with an accent. Oh yeah, you dude. must have just been rolling in drowning the in it, man. Drowning. <laughs> I mean, for real, it right? was insane. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I like because I I lived in the UK, but like, there's a lot of Australians in the UK. Yeah, you guys just sound like them, but retarded. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's there's more of a plucky charm to the Australian accent because everything goes up at the end. Yeah. And I'll sure. be like, Jez, how are you doing? And you're like, Yeah, yeah, good, good. I'm, you know, yep, uh huh. And it's like everyone. There's you know, an enthusiasm, I think. There's to an enthusiasm. Australian culture. Right. Yeah. There's like a like I had an Uber driver who was telling me the racist history of Sydney, <laughs> which he was like proud of, you know. Yeah, like, and that's Redfern where they riot, and boy, did we bring the kill doses to them. <laughs> but I would ask him a question, and everything was was uh, was prefaced with, well, he would say, "Look," he'd be like, "Look." Well, you know, like yeah. there was just always like they have this an initial, I'm engaged. I'm talking to you. I heard what you said, and now I'm going to respond. Right. And they have their own unique, like, typifier of that, which I like. Yeah, I mean, it was it was something where... In the UK, the, the accent helped, but um, in the US, it was... A deluge. It was almost a problem. <laughs> <laughs> How much people wanted to fuck me. Yeah. And particularly because I was coming off a divorce. Oh, yeah. And, like, a You were mess. probably wearing some kind of, like, fringe jacket. Your hair's in your <laughs> oh, eyes. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but, no, it was it was a lot of fun. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm from Perth. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the most isolated place in the world. My daddy did seven years. <laughs> Nothing crazy. <laughs> me? I was in the army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know I left. <laughs> yeah, these yeah. are all just facts. That you're yeah, you're like married in Las Vegas. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. But yeah, I think that's why I managed to get on that that girl in Brooklyn's couch for three months. Like, it definitely, eventually, it was. She did not want me there, but she couldn't like say no to this Dude, cute little Australian boy. Charm is the only currency they have here. <laughs> it's so far away. A beer's twenty five dollars. Uh, like, if it wasn't just the most fun, I don't know if you could sell it on the world stage. Mm. Anything uh, you want to? Any, you seven more minutes. Anything you want to tell these people? Anything they should know about the the man known as Jez White Rice Supreme? Uh, Watts? Uh, I don't know. I think we probably covered some good stuff. Uh, what about uh, how would you? How do you think Australian comedy could get better? Uh, I just be more American, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's, um, well, the festival circuit is so entrenched here, where you guys have to do every city's festival for the first six months of the year, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's that a few guarantee... festivals in the back half as well. But... Okay. Is that like in Edinburgh? Because my understanding of Edinburgh is if you're a UK comic and you do Edinburgh or an Irish comic or you live over there at all, then the rest of the, your year is just booked. If you have a good showing at Edinburgh, it's like, oh, okay, God. now here's all your shows for the rest of the year, and then next year you come back, and then if you do good again, you get another round of bookings. I would say that's less true here. I mean, it's just that it's that small market syndrome that there's just only so many spots to go around. But like, some there, if you win an award here, at one of the festivals which that's the thing that's, it's a big like reviewer culture and, and yeah. award culture four stars best newcomer yeah if you get an award here that really is gonna like bump your income for the rest of the year and does that bump you by you're now you're on the panel shows now you're on maybe, like, the, yeah. the TV talk shows maybe some thing. TV stuff but certainly like some of the bigger like promoters in here will have big shows They'll, you know instead of like doing some bar show for 50 bucks you might be doing a theater show for a thousand or fifteen hundred yeah um and there's a bunch of those around and they they tour to like little cities and stuff as well like and who are these promoters like, like century that runs comedy store okay and like a list and uh, token that that like is very big in melbourne um, and they have their fingers in in darwin and perth and all these different cities yeah they control it i mean that's the thing i've never uh if you talk to anyone who has management here, they're always bitching about it, being like, oh, they take all this money, and it's like, yeah, but also you're, like, getting all these shows that you wouldn't have booked on your own. Right. And I think there's obviously a benefit to it. Um, not that anyone's ever offered to represent me, but... But then if you have a bad, like, showing at the festivals, then are you, like, boned for the year? I don't think so. I mean, I think the festivals... My experience with festivals is different, right? Because I've never done, like, festival-managed stuff. I've never got any, like, industry heat. 
but I sell out shows and I live off the money. Yeah. Which is my goal, mm-hmm. is to be able to do comedy all the time and have the money to be able to do that. So it's this thing of like, there's, you know, there's different ways to approach your career in comedy, of course, and different kinds of comedy you can be doing and different things you might be shooting for. Like, some people are getting into comedy in order to be on TV. Right, for sure. Which I just love doing jokes and stuff, so... <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why I liked your friend, um, is it he, he, he Wang? He Huang, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huang, yeah. Because she was just like, I don't give a shit about any of this bullshit, I just want to do stand-up. Yeah, 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 <laughs> but, like, but like, people have been, like, she's been crushing it the last, like, year and a half. Yeah. Um, she got on, like, Australia's Got Talent, and her clip went, like, viral, like, 60 million views or whatever. Right. Um... And so, like, that led to a bunch of other things. And now she's getting on TV and stuff. But she doesn't care about TV. It's just, they like, offer her a bunch of money. And it's going to sell more tickets for her stand-up, which 100%. she cares about. Yeah. So it's like, when she first started getting offered it, with really good friends, she was like, oh, I don't really want to do these things. Should I do them? I'm like, yes, you should absolutely do them. Yeah. Because they're going to enable you to get what you want in other areas of the industry. Um, but, yeah, I mean... The back half of your year in Australia is usually prepping for next year's festival. So it's just so there's a lot of people. Cycle. Yeah, a lot of people like September, October, November, December. Like a different different cohorts of people start to go. Fuck, the festivals are going to come up soon. Sure. What's my new hour? Yeah. And then like, man, every every gig in Melbourne for the month before the comedy festival starts there is the worst show you've ever seen in your life. Oh, shit. Because it doesn't matter who's paid what money to see it, every act is doing all new. Because <laughs> they they need it for their festival show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, that's the thing. I'm, I, I want to record my first special next year. I want to get this comedy musical ready like for the year after. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see how things go. I think you're in. I think you're in the driver's seat, <laughs> <laughs> literally and figuratively. <laughs> Why is it? What was that science that stop, survive, revive, stop, revive, oh, survive? Have a rest, like pull over, have a nap, oh. and then don't die on the road by falling asleep. Oh, it's like in the states when you're in Nevada, it's like drunk driving, thirty years in prison, you know, like. And then you cross over into Utah, and it's like, drowsy driving is dangerous driving. <laughs> it's literally at the state line where the Mormons control, and they're like, take a nap. Everything's fine. And then you cross over in Nevada, and it's like, you know, just a fucking raining sin from the sky. I saw an ad on, like, television in the States when I was over there, like, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And the whole advertisement was just, uh, it was just examples of people being nice to each other. And at the end, it just said, be kind. And it had no company. Yeah. It had no, like, sign-off of, like, here's the person that paid for it. No. It was it's... just an advertisement to be nice. Yeah. And it's paid for by... Definitely a church One of the paid churches, yeah. But I love that they didn't put their church name on it. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, they had one of those during the Super Bowl, and it was, like, one of the most talked about ads, because no one could figure out who the fuck it was. Right. And it ended up just being, like, a fundamentalist church from Arizona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't believe in women's rights or anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> be kind, unless, you know, you need... Reproductive health. You know what I and we'll we'll wrap this up. You know what I can't figure out is why like uh, more American comedians don't try and come down here and like make this a more dominant market for them. Because like I think most comics come down every like three years. Like if you're right. an American comic and then you like do it, you blow it out, you get your money and you leave. It's like these are very good comedy crowds. At least the ones that we had in uh, Sydney and then in Newcastle. Like I do think Australian crowds are tend to be really like respectful audience members, but, but also they're not also like, really engaged. They're engaged. They're also not like you can joke about whatever you want for the most part. For sure. Like I bet in like Melbourne, there's more like you know fucking uh, people wearing sweaters. Like that <laughs> might not be so open to some of the more irreverent shit that I'm into. Oh, I actually think they'll be fine. Oh, I yeah, think yeah. they will too because there's not like malevolence in what I'm doing. Exactly. But like you know, it's like you go to Brooklyn, like some. People get touchy about certain words, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's just like the crowds that we've had here have just been like so excited. Like this show at the comedy store in Sydney, there's like 110 people there or whatever, but still, that was a hot ass fucking show. Yeah. Like that hour, I could have just kept going if I was allowed to because they were so with it. They were so comedy literate. Like mm. it was just that was, that was a good show, man. I yeah. could have, I, I could have, I could have put that one out probably. I mean, we were. I, I did record it in 4K, so we'll see. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go through it with a fine tooth and probably send it off to my band Patrick to get clips out of it. But 
Yeah. Okay, tell them where they can find you, Jez. Uh, JezWatts.com, J-E-Z-W-A-T-T-S. Oh, yeah, Zed. <laughs> Zed <laughs> yeah, is so we, funny. We say Zed, yeah. Yeah. Um, I also do a, a, let's call it an air quotes, like, weekly podcast with my fiance Nicole. It's a veterinary medicine podcast that I'm silly on. Yeah. She explains about, like, different issues in pet health to me, and I'm like an idiot she's getting frustrated with. Um, they're only 10-minute ten, ten episodes. It's called the Tiny Vet Podcast. Oh, perfect. And that Instagram? Yeah, I'm on all the socials. Jez Watts Comedy. J-E-Z-W-A-T-T-S. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Jez. Thank you.